Essentially, this is just ideas of aluminum. Aluminum is a very interesting and unique metal. It forms oxides very rapidly, which can lead to a certain level of difficulty in welding. And there are a lot of variables which a person must be conscientious about and consider while welding. But we'll start off with this. Aluminum has an oxide layer that melts at 3700 degrees Fahrenheit. And when you brush this oxide layer off, the material underneath the oxide layer melts at 1220. Now when it comes to brushing the metal, you brush always only in one direction, whether it's downward stroke or an upward stroke. And the reason for this is because you brush in one direction to remove the oxide, while if you move backwards in a returning backstroke, because the metal is soft, the bristles not only chew into the soft material, but also embed the oxides in deeper. When it comes to welding aluminum, there are two individual pipe fit-ups I have been taught. Typically on smaller diameter pipe up to 2.5 inches, you can use a 116 land, while 3 to 12 inch, you can use a 332 land for the extended land fit up. I had noticed with welding aluminum and trying different welding techniques that may work on other particular metals that when it comes to trying to back feed aluminum, it is almost as if the filament metal senses the electricity of the arc. And with a filament metal back fed internally inside the pipe, it'll actually arc out to the bevel tips themselves. Zirconated tungsten and pure are a very common tungsten most commonly used in the application of welding aluminum. But when it comes to the selection of tungsten, it comes down to personal preference, tungsten performance at elevated temperatures, and temperatures held over duration, the overall condition of the tungsten as well as the application with which the tungsten will be used and if it will hold or retain its shape, prep, and or taper while welding. I'm using a lanthanated tungsten for the root pass. I have the this tungsten prepped to a sharp point, which would allow me to focus solely upon the bevel tips themselves to allow for more pre precise control for the root pass. However, I do want to mention that the use of pure tungsten will ball and will allow for more surface area, which the tungsten can be held in the middle of the gap, and with its ball shape and more surface area in such shape, it will have not only better cleaning action, but also able to melt both bevel tips as well. Though personal preference and practice, I like the sharp point. The very same settings on the machine would actually ball a pure tungsten if it were sharpened to a point, while it is not doing as such with the lanthanated. Basically down here, there are a listing of things I would consider relatively critical to keep in mind while performing the root pass. But the very reason why I mention them in a numerical order is because when speaking about neuro-linguistics programming, when you read those books, and they're not particularly welding books, but more so teaching others how to learn and how to be more observant, in the book it talks about modes of learning. It would have unconscious incompetence, such as if you're a welding student just starting out, you would be incompetent when it comes to doing something. And it would also be unconscious in the sense that you don't know that you do not know how to do something. From there, you would have conscious incompetence, which means that you would be consciously aware that you do not know how to do this particular thing that you are now aware of its very existence. We move to conscious competence now. When you are aware and capable of doing something, but you still need to think about the very act while performing the task at hand. We now have unconscious competence, which means that you can perform something second nature. In neurolinguistics, it mentions that the conscious mind is able to consciously be aware of 7 plus 2 minus things simultaneously. So how this all comes into play and why I have mentioned neurolinguistics is because while performing the root pass, these are things that myself, but also you the welder, need to be be consciously aware of while doing the root pass. Number one on this list is that you'll be holding the torch perpendicular to the weld puddle. Because I am holding the torch perpendicular to the pipe, the weld puddle is round in shape and flattened. The outside diameter of the pipe, including the heat effective zone beyond the weld puddle, is protected away from the atmosphere now by the inside diameter of the ceramic cup. It also needs to be mentioned that aluminum, as well as other metals, but aluminum, rapidly forms oxides, which their formation while welding happens like this. While welding from A to B, the weld puddle is protected within the inert gas of the ceramic cup. As you are traveling, you are always protecting the weld puddle itself, but leaving behind depositing metal. Now, it is this depositing metal itself, what temperature is it at when it is allowed to interact with the atmosphere, determines how rapidly the metal is going to form a protective oxide layer, as well as the thickness of the oxide layer. But also consider this too, what is the parts per million of oxygen that is in the atmosphere that is allowed to interact with the depositing metal once it leaves the inert gas of the ceramic cup? These all come into play with the formation of oxidization, and something to think about even when you want to get coloration out of stainless steel. Cup size too plays a role as well. 
how long that weld puddle can be protected away from the atmosphere and the temperature the puddle will be at once it is no longer protected. When you look at the other drawing of the torch that is held at a slight angle, maybe even 10 degrees, the weld puddle ends up going oblong in shape and the leading edge of the weld puddle is now able to interact with the atmosphere as well as the heat affected zone of the oblong weld puddle. The metal is heating up, it is rapidly forming oxides to protect itself and of course you are now welding over these oxides while traveling from A to B. Number two on the list is be observant and aware that you are continuously opening and maintaining a keyhole. When it comes to the size of the keyhole, you need to ensure that each bevel tip has been melted away with a minimum of 1 16 of an inch. In the case of aluminum, it will be that the keyhole is very glossy and shiny on both bevel tips prior to adding in filler metal. But when it comes to adding in filler metal, you also need to be conscientiously aware of the influence and effects that gravity has while you're dabbing filler metal into the weld puddle. The most important thing to understand while welding an open root butt weld with aluminum is that you need to remember that you have all the time in the world to add in filler metal once you open a keyhole. You do not need to move as fast as the metal wants you to go. You can take your time, move the filler metal through your fingers to get prepared to add the next addition of filler to add in. You have as much time as you need so slow everything down. And actually in terms of neurolinguistics, even break down the movements into their most intricate mechanical components that make up the very technique so that your technique is not only very simplified but also incredibly purposeful and accurate in its movements. Number three on the list is adding in filament metal to the hottest point of the puddle. With the filament metal being fed externally on the outside of the pipe, the root pass is going in by capillary action. Now, where you can add filament metal depends on the influence that gravity will have. Normally on a 2G horizontal and a 6G well placed in a 45 degree angle, typically you add filament metal to the uppermost portion of the puddle so that gravity will pull the deposit metal downwards. If adding to a 5G position, then it needs to be added to the middle of the gap so the weld puddle is of uniformity. As an additional side note, you need to be aware of how large of a keyhole you are making so the internal crater can be filled. On an extended land fit up for a horizontal and 6G, 45 degree angle position, it is very easy for the internal root pass to go bell shaped, with suck back and concavity on the uppermost portion of the root pass due to the influence of gravity acting on the weld puddle as well as the size of crater you are creating and if you are filling in the void of metal to compensate. Number four is keeping the tip of the fill metal protected within the inert gas of the ceramic cup. This is a very important mention, also a reason why in the titanium video as well I am using a size 12 ceramic cup. Essentially aluminum and other metals, the tip of the fill metal needs to be protected within the envelope of the inert gas of the ceramic cup while you are adding in fill metal to the well puddle. This prevents the tip of the fill metal from being exposed to the atmosphere where it will form oxides and those oxides will be added to the well puddle in such case. You want to keep the fill metal within the envelope of the ceramic cup at all times and you can use more of an up and down dab technique. A welding technique you want to avoid is one where you do a move forward and backwards dabbing and pulling away technique. You want to avoid that technique. Keeping the tip of the fill metal protected within the inert gas is a staple and crucial necessity among welding exotic and specialty metals. The other thing with aluminum is that you have to be, aluminum is the unfortunate metal that you cannot touch with your tungsten because uh, you can you can get away with say if you're welding stainless steel or something or carbon chrome you can accidentally touch the tungsten it's not a huge deal as long as it doesn't get a tungsten inclusion mm -hmm. but you can touch it oops okay and then you can keep on welding but on aluminum uh, on aluminum unfortunately if you even touch the tungsten sometimes if your tungsten gets very close you'll kind of hear the machine buzz a little mm -hmm. bit differently yeah. but the second it touches it it makes like a huge little micro explosion and you get black soot everywhere and it just contaminates the tungsten, contaminates the weld zone, and it embeds, uh, you, you can embed tungsten into the material. It, it contaminates your, 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 the aluminum contaminates the tungsten as well. So everything is basically contaminated. That, that metal has to be removed uh, with uh, woodworking tools, a wood router, or a file. Because uh, you will, when you file it, you will find embed tungsten into the uh, aluminum material. Wow.